Hello, everyone. It's seven o'clock sharp. So we're going to get going. Um, hello, these are our Friday night instructor presentations. Um, we only have three classes going on right now, and we only have two instructors here tonight, so it should be a quick night. Um, but basically, both of our instructors will take turns giving 10 minute presentations. It's a really fun night, and I'm glad you're here for it. Um, I like to warm up the crowd with a joke before I get going. I found a website that is a dad joke generator. And I looked at five of them earlier. One was not funny. Two were pretty offensive. One I didn't understand. And the fifth one was really funny. So I'm going to give it a go and see what happens. Hmm. No, I'm going to do another one. Did you hear about the new corduroy pillows? They're making headlines. All right, so uh, first we're gonna start, okay, Janine came in the nick of time, so we're gonna start with Janine. Um, and introducing Janine tonight will be me, because my assistant is off having fun taking a class at Penland right now. So Janine Wang is a woodworker and teacher from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, she's a wood attorney professor at Bucks County Community College and a building hero educator at Tiny WPA. Um, she is currently pursuing a residency at Goggleworks in Reading, Pennsylvania, where she is working to translate wood turned forms into ceramics via slip casting. Um, when she's not turning, Janine in, Janine enjoys basket weaving and driving her Honda Accord with the sunroof open. Please let me welcome Janine Wang. All right, come on up. If you want a microphone, you can turn that. Up. No. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. I will kind of go quickly through this. This is a long presentation. Um, I'm born and raised in New York. It was nice in its own way. I was able to just do things like go to the Met after school, which is pretty incredible, or like go to some like specialty shop for, I don't know, like, imported Japanese jewelry supplies, something like that. And I could just like, I'd get three rides every day as a high schooler commuting in the city. Uh, one to get to school, one to get home, and then one to do with whatever I wanted. So I did a lot of dumb stuff, um, but um, in it was just like a lot of, I feel like it instilled a certain level of freedom and like, uh, it, uh, autonomy that I wouldn't have gotten any other way um so I thought like hey I freaking love the city I'm gonna go to architecture school so I did the thing I went to architecture school I wanted to create like that built environment that I loved so much and then I realized architects don't actually know how to build a lot of the time <laughs> Um, there's like this really big vast expanse between design and building and so like I just kind of got very cynical I mean architecture school is also a really stressful place so I felt it was like making me a bad person um, all I was learning was like how to present and how to like develop really good ideas but then like was powerless to do anything after that um, during that time I actually I did so badly in school that I had to take a year off <laughs> And um, at that time, I went and like tried a few different things to see if this is what I really wanted to do. I worked with a woodworker, um, Takashi Miyakawa, who um, ended up becoming like a really important mentor for me. He had a wood shop in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, where he like would do the design and had architecture training, which is how I found him. Um, and then he was able to like make it all happen in his wood shop. Uh, this is the first woodworking project I ever made. It was like a set of adjustable stairs for my aging dog so she could get in and out of the car and it was like adjustable for both sizes of cars we had. I felt really great about it and during that time I also figured found out what it's like to live and work in a wood shop um, and just like make yourself at home in there. Uh, oh that's my dog. <laughs> um, she wow. So she, uh, yeah, she had arthritis. She was also like a hundred pounds. And so she was not able to get in the car after a while. And it's like a downward spiral, spiral if you've ever, ever had a big dog. 
they can't exercise, then they don't exercise and the arthritis gets worse. So it was important to us that she could come on hikes with us. Um, in the background is also the house that my parents bought in the Poconos, pretty close by, honestly. Um, that was the first time that this like, our like super urban, like Chinese family, like even my parents are from like Shanghai, which is like another really big city. We were total city slickers. We moved into the mountains suddenly, just like almost on a whim from my mom. And um, we started seeing just like we saw our neighbors do shit we'd never seen before. <laughs> um, they're kind of, um, I was talking about uh, like the autonomy of living in a city and being able to bring your body to wherever you want to go. Um, the Our neighbors were able to change the world around them with their bodies. It was almost inverse. So like they do things like fix their own house, put up all their own siding. My parents ended up like getting dragged into a lot of that work too. They started fixing houses. They started buying all the foreclosed houses um, in our neighborhood. And they were like disgusting, moldy, mess of shells of places. And they became experts. Like my two skinny Chinese parents, they like, I saw them put to like drywall an entire ceiling of a whole floor of a house together, which is if you've ever tried to do that, insanely hard um and they did a no problem um so this is I ended up going to furniture school and this is a drawing that my teacher drew for me one day of a like symbol of a chair and he asked why would we make something like that when our bodies look like this um is that okay is that necessary do we need to conform our bodies to the shapes of the world around us when in reality like these posts are straight because it's easy to machine them like that. It's not necessarily because it was designed for us. Um, and at furniture school is when I found wood turning, which is the opposite. It like, you can make forms that are especially lovely to the human body and which conform to you really relatively quickly. So I made a whole bunch of furniture. <laughs> um, this is my first piece, which I never show because I think it's really ugly, but the top is made out of spindles that all nest together and they all spin. So when you sit on top, you actually get to move and it feels really amazing for something that's entirely made out of like hard maple. It's so comfortable. Like it, your sit bones like fit in everywhere. Um, that was based off this drawing series of um, people at work. So it was like honest portraits of people while they're working and it showed like how they moved and you can kind of see, sorry, the PDF got kind of messed up when we converted it to a PowerPoint, but you're going to see like the spaces around the people are where the furniture are. Um, I made this table that had a like ornamental apron application. It was um, a wood turned bead that I turned a quarter out of, and then I was able to apply that to like hard edges and surfaces to make them instantly comfortable. Um, the dimensions of the bead were sized to the dimension of my hand. So when you help, held on to it, it felt fantastic. So like, I still have this table, like picking it up and putting it anywhere in your house is just a joy. You can even like, I dragged it to, I brought it to a show yesterday where I threw it in my car and then like, I just tucked it right here and like the legs were sticking out, but it was like really easy and comfortable to walk with. Um, this is a series of wood turned stools based on like the one legged milking stool. But the idea that like if you make all these accommodating shapes without like strict like people don't necessarily know what to do with them because the symbol of like the chair is not so obvious in it um people came up with amazing ways to use these pieces of furniture especially like in combination with each other um i did a bunch of like malleable furniture as well uh, this piece, you can like wrangle it and form it into shapes that you want, like at, in whatever environment you're in, according to your body, at whatever time you feel like. Um, like the bottom, it's in the stool, stool mode, the middle, it's in like lounge mode, and the top, my partner calls that full drunk mode. <laughs> it's just like out. Um, this is a variety of upholstered woolen stones that are all, um, they've got all these like secret textures inside of them. So you can't really tell what it's gonna feel like until you actually sit in there. So like, uh, I should have included the photo here, but like 
Some of it is upholstered with garden gate springs. So like the seat wiggles around like this. Uh, some of it, it's got latex in it. There's like a, that little round egg shaped one has like one of those posture helping like air pocket things in it, which you would never know until you like actually sat your butt down into it. The idea is to create like a landscape on itself, um, similar to like the way I was thinking of Central Park when I was, when I did this, similar to the way like you can find just your spot in a landscape. Um, these are a bunch, this was thinking about a way to display the personal things in your life without actually having to put them on display because I think the word display means usually you display for someone else and rarely do you ever like get to do it for yourself. So I was trying to think of ways to do that. Um, this is a series of wood turn vessels based on hand gestures. So each one is held in a different way. And then like uh, the wood turned form represents say like uh, the one, the second one on the left is called like the power chalice. You grab it like this, you like chug like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, each one of them has like a different meaning and connotation behind it. This is the series that I wanna try to slip cast so you can actually use all of these vessels because right now it's just pure fine art. Like I would never, like I, ha I would have to sell these for hundreds of dollars in order to account for the amount of time I put into them. And you can't drink coffee out of something you paid like $250 out of that you'll ruin immediately. So um, that was the idea. Uh, this is a series about the emerald ash borer, which is a disease extinguishing ash trees all over America right now. Um, it's called holding on the aftermath because there's no solution <laughs> to it at all. Um, the ash trees are just gonna go extinct for a little while. Um, there are 9 billion of them in North America. So um, I worked with the School Coal Center for Environmental Education near Philly to, uh, to make one of their sick trees into art. Or um, for me, that meant into furniture because furniture is the best form of art. Um, <clears throat> they, I got to talk with their uh, lead arborist who showed me all the ways that the ash, board, the ash tree manifests its sickness like on its outside. So say, for example, here, um, the ash borer like digs into the bark and like the bark opens up and the fissure forms and you can see all the insides and um, the tree has energy just like people. And, and when on a good year, it can like put energy into growing. It can put energy having babies, things like that. A sick tree just puts all of its energy into trying to like heal itself and close its wounds. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them and the idea was to cross all of these um uh these <laughs> manifestations of pain with like the human affordances of a handle and to let the tree live on and have its story told within your own household um and also to give you something to talk about when you're like, so every person that I sold the, these to, I told everything about the Emerald Ash Borer and now they can spread the word too. Um, this is a nightstand that I did in collaboration with my partner. Um, that is actually a steam bent split turned wood turning. <clears throat> the idea was that, um, that's a little bit too long to explain, but it's a, it's a nightstand for everything that you don't want anyone else to see. That's him, and that's my cat, Nori. Um, we also have made a bunch of steam bent and basket woven crossovers together. I learned basket weaving here at Peters Valley in 2018. <laughs> um, and I've been crossing into my work a whole lot. And um, I, my partner and I are actually teaching a workshop together for the first time on this stuff with the Center for Art and Wood in Philly and um, Glenn Ford. And I mean, I have a lot to thank this place for. Thank you guys. <laughs> um, this is a split turned frame. This is the largest split turning I've ever made. It was a collaboration with the um, artist Diego Salazar who wanted to create a Mexican ofrenda, which is like an altar to the Twin Towers. So we did this last year in honor of the 20th anniversary. And I have made a lot of furniture. 
when I have time. I also somewhere along the way started writing articles and like sharing what I knew and what I found and discovered. And this has been really great because people write back and they like show me what they've done and it's like really gratifying. Um, I also taught briefly uh, with Suzanne Kahn of Dovetail Wood Arts to bring wood turning and woodworking to, well, this class, the first class we had was all teenage girls from the local neighborhood. Um, and then slowly, slowly, I started doing more and more teaching stuff. Um, the left is a video that was an accompaniment with that article. The right is, uh, I've made like hundreds of basket weaving kits now that you can like learn basket weaving at home. And uh, now I've been able to fully transition into being a teaching artist, which is really awesome. Um, I teach at, like uh, Jamie mentioned, Bucks County Community College. Um, I've done a lot of Zoom stuff in this, the pandemic, which has been great. And um, this is the work I do with Tiny WPA, bringing like building skills to people who have little to none and don't really know otherwise how to get it. Um, we've some of like this like eight week intensive where we start out with just learning how to use a drill and then going on to machinery and table saws and all that. Um, that's all I got right now. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Um, I'll do one more joke. Just so Jean gets one also. I can't promise you, I think it's random. Um, I don't get this one. <laughs> what do you call <laughs> what do you call a monkey in a minefield? A baboom. Um Josh will liked it, so I'm fine with that. Um yeah, that's a fun echo. All right, next up, we are going to have Jean Adams in ceramics, and introducing her will be Logan Stallings. Okay, so uh, Jean Adams is here. I get to introduce her, so exciting. Um, Jean Adams is a New Jersey native, though she's also spent time in Connecticut and Northeastern Pennsylvania. Jean grew up with a very artistic father who worked as a jeweler, and it was because of her creative upbringing that she became the precise and detail-oriented artist that she is today. Um, Jean has been teaching in the ceramics department at Wilkes University, formerly Wilkes College. Um, since 1985, and she is a proud mother of two girls, her finest works of art. Yeah, and uh, she recently relocated to Bluebell, PA, outside of Philadelphia to be closer to her growing family. Growing hard again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, where do I start? It's so hard because. I've been working in place since 1976. So many people have passed before me and many people that have influenced my life. And I can't possibly mention all of them, even though I would love to. But the two, there are two people that stand out. So my father, of course, is one of them. And I'm going to show you, if I push the right button here, some work that my father did. He, he worked for a um, jewelry firm in New York City called David Webb. They're a very high-end jeweler. He also did work for Bulgari and Cartier from time to time. Um, he started with his talents with metal smithing and jewelry when he was actually a CB in the Navy. He did a lot of iron work. And after that, he got an apprenticeship and he um, just built a career on that. So this is a piece that's chasing and repoussé. It's actually lined with wood. I don't know what kind of wood it is because I don't identify woods. <laughs> um, this is a small pill box that he made. And I dropped down the, the base of the box so you could see, but it's, it's incredibly precise. It's 18 karat gold. It's about an inch and three quarters high. 
So um, yeah, these are the kind of little items that I grew up with, if that gives you a clue. And the third one of his that I will show is a um, gold piece, again, 18 karat gold, which is enameled with rubies. <clears throat> and there are other ones that Webb also, David Webb, the company made, which would have had diamonds all throughout them, which were, yeah, pretty, pretty. <laughs> but um, maybe a little bit more than I would have liked. So anyway, th th this is um, 18 karat gold and then enameled on it, which is, it gets pretty technical. So I grew up with him, right? And I was by his side all the time. And it's amazing when you're a craftsperson, how many things can one craft can affect another or teach you something about the other. So I feel like even though I didn't follow in his jewelry footsteps, I did follow in the craft footsteps. And I learned an awful lot from him. The next person that I want to talk about is Byron Temple. Because while I've taken many workshops and studied under many people, he was probably the one that had the greatest influence on me. He worked small for the most part. He was very precise. And what I learned from him was how much a small form can say. So um, I, because of that, I'm gonna show you a couple of his. I, I had a pot just, oh, I still have the pot just like that. But mine, actually this one was made, I think, once he moved to Kentucky, because it has a round seal on it. And mine has a broken lid. There's two pots of mine that were broken because of my children. My one child, that was one of them. But anyway, <laughs> hope she's not listening. This is another one of his tie boxes, beautiful little tie boxes. <clears throat> and now you're stuck with me. So I'm gonna just show you some of my work. My work began very functional. And um, as any potter wants to do, we wanna throw things that are nice and even and round and, you know, um, try forms and I, I what I found with clay is it's sometimes very difficult to make things where you are um, making a piece that's functional and aesthetically pleasing because sometimes form and function don't always work well together so that's always been one of my big focuses was trying to make the two things work well together it's another just teapot and this is my this is when I was doing a lot of glazing, but I, again, I'm, I'm a minimalist. And so I tend not to use a lot of different glazes together. I tend to just do it rather simply. This is just, I've started to play with patterns, hitting my pots, um, giving them a good whack and then reshaping them, changing their tops. And after, you know, you go through so many phases and after a while, my life really changed when my kids left the house and when my parents weren't living across the street from me anymore. And I had a little bit more time to myself and I could experiment with some things that I otherwise couldn't do. And I started to really play with um, underglazes and just the design of the piece. So this is a, an oval box. Boxes come from probably my father. Lots of little, little things. And I'm not petite, I don't know if you noticed that, but I like to make small forms. So another one, some underglazes and just seeing how the underglazes work with different clay bodies is another thing that I was really focused on. This is a uh, wood fired piece. Again, I just like small little details that um, enhance a piece of the pot, but not necessarily the entire thing. Another, um, this was soda fired. And this was under glazes. There was also a flashing slip on there. I'm fascinated with handles. And so I went through a phase where I wanted to see just how tall I could make them before they would fall. <laughs> That's about my limit. <laughs> and then I started to play with transferring um, patterns. So. Again, it's almost like um, if you, I was saying this today to the class, you know, when you have the Cracker Jack boxes and you got those little tattoos that you put on, it's the same kind of thing where you can um, paint designs on Xerox or copies and you can then transfer it onto your pots. And this is also soda fired. This is also thrown, altered. So it's um, 
I threw the original piece, I altered it, and then I added a top on. Again, you'll see some, if you look closely, you'll see some design change with the striping on the one side being horizontal and the other side being vertical. So I just like to play with surface change. And again, a soda fired piece where I play with flashing slips. And then this is a, um, I'm fascinated with mugs. Uh, if you only could see my mug collection at home, I have probably, and they're not all by me, um, a lot are, but they're not all by me. I probably have about 70 mugs, which is kind of obscene, but <laughs> it's fun to change them. It's fun to drink from different ones. It's fun to, you, you have a real relationship with the piece that you're drinking from. So um, I started to play with Mishima, which is where you have some recesses and you put color in it and then you wipe away and it leaves that black line. And again, like I said, I'm fascinated with handles and color. So I like color a lot too. And color at high temperatures is not always easy to maintain. So I've worked with a lot of underglazes and I found which ones work best for me. This is just, this is the first one of these that I did actually. And sometimes the first ones may be one of your better ones. So I, I like this one and I still have it at home. These are soda fire. This is soda fire pot. And I just love the way that with the striping and then the glaze kind of catches in those areas. So it, it creates that pattern at the top that I didn't plan, nor could I have planned. And sometimes that's the best thing about clay is that you can't always decide what it's going to do. This is a little wood fired piece. Again, I do the Mishima and then I do a lot of resist with some um, taping. This one's a uh, soda fired also. And then my work started to, um, when I first started to do wood fire, I started to get a little bit sculptural too, but they're not large. This is maybe 10 inches tall. So never really big, but I like to play with different surfaces and angles. And again, another one. And I'm also, again, go back to my father, fascinated with boxes. So this is just, you throw these as a closed form and then you cut them open later. So this is one of my closed form boxes. And one more of those. And while I do work really small now, I am getting older. So I just keep telling people I have to work smaller than I used to. I did used to throw some platters, which were larger in size. This one's probably about 20, 21 inches across. Um, that's probably not my best one either, but it's the only one that I could find the picture of. So this, you're stuck with this one. But um, I, I love them. I love, I did love making them. I hated firing them because they take up so much room in the kiln. But, um, and, and if you didn't have success, it was a little bit more upsetting than maybe a smaller piece would be but um, they were always a nice challenge and it's always great to have a challenge for yourself. And then I'm gonna end with one pot, which is a piece that I made for Tom's Shoes. So you all know Tom's Shoes, right? So there was a fundraiser where we were all making a piece of art to raise money for, um, I guess, just to support the needy. And I made a shoe box with, and I of course um, have, you know, shoes that are falling off the box and I put fishnet stockings on the side of the box and then have a shoe as the lifting handle on the top. And that is pretty much my, um, my talk for tonight. So thank you. Oh, wait a minute, I'm not done. You have to wait. Because I realized that I didn't thank Peter's Valley. So thank you so much to Peter's Valley. But thank you to Poen and, um, oh my God, and Logan. I was going to say Landon <laughs> and Elizabeth, because I couldn't have asked for better people to work with in the studio. Thank you very much. Well, now, I'm, now I'm done. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, you know what? I, I don't want to even try to okay. stop You could read one of my random ones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Joshua really wants one more joke, so I'm going to tell one more joke. Gene doesn't think it's necessary, but Joshua really wants it. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. That's it for this week. Um, I have to do something once you get it back. Thanks, everyone on the internet. That's for Anna. And since Joshua's enjoying the joke so much, we're going to go out on one more joke. Um, Joshua, have you heard about the restaurant on the moon? The food is great, but there's no atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank you all. Hello, and thank you so much for watching this program. Peters Valley would like to thank its sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to Peters Valley's channel to receive more like it in the future.